You know, Industry 4.0 and automation, they go together like hand in glove, and everyone's talking about it in the industry in all aspects of manufacturing. I'm with Ben Hope. He's technical driver for advanced manufacturing Industry 4.0 with Festo Canada. And Ben, we're talking about vertical integration, horizontal integration, and end-to-end -end engineering when we think about Industry 4.0. Tell me about it. So from an automation standpoint, the core components are going to be vertical integration, which is top floor to shop floor communication, and then the idea of end-to-end -end engineering. So communicating and coordinating engineering data along the entire value chain. So how do we implement that from our perspective? Well, the industrial internet of things is the idea that we can communicate with our automation components. So this enables us to harvest data and translate it into useful information. So it's the idea of big data and it connects us to the physical operation. Now, what I'm thinking, Ben, is that in the old days, and the grand old days being 30 years ago or so, typically, for example, a tier one supplier to an aerospace manufacturer, automotive manufacturer, would often use a satellite downlink and then attempt to extract some amount of information about plant operations. But usually it was intermediated by a person at some point. Right. There'd be a plant manager, engineer somewhere that had to translate that information into a go, no go decision about, say, operations or, or running a machine down here. But they went to the Ethernet sort of model of we're going to wire everything with blue wire through the ceiling at this point. Is it uh, how much efficiency can you gain by eliminating that human intermediary in the process? Well, you can start using things like analytical software to identify things in the plant that you want to get feedback on. So if you want to implement uh, predictive maintenance, for example, or you want to monitor energy, you can optimize it. You can also make business decisions based on real-time information. So it's a matter of taking the data and turning it into something useful for the operation. I mean, historically, uh, it's, it's been a sensors and actuators world on the shop floor. Mm -hmm. uh, actuators typically, whether it's process control, whether it's uh, valves, switches, uh, solenoids, of course, these things, we, we're, we now we consider them as dumb. They weren't dumb at the time, of course. Sure. Uh, the question is, is that how does the feedback loop work at this point? Do the, do the actuators themselves generate the, the, the data themselves and feed it back to the line, or do we infer operation by things like uh, current load, for example, or, or with uh, position? It's going to depend on the sophistication of the device. So you take a servo drive, for example, you can monitor the current profile of the motion of, of an electrical axis. And from that you can de define if the bearing is good or the bearing is bad or the bearing is about to fail, maybe. But sensors are different. So sensors maybe need to be um, interfaced to some sort of higher level control system that then takes that on and understands what's going on from the sensor perspective and then translate that up to the enterprise system or an MES system, ERP system, et cetera. And then the classic pushback from the manufacturing engineer, uh, the production engineer, has been cost and complexity. Sure. Historically, to put a sensor net in that could monitor all those various parameters, there was expensive, difficult, and it itself became a maintenance issue in and of itself. Do you, do you trust the information coming from analog type devices at this point? Uh, are there cost advantages to doing it the modern way now? Are these things sort of integrated in a more of a Lego blocks fashion? Yeah, I think mo modular automation is becoming a big kind of idea. So you're designing um, functionality and you're modularizing it and making it autonomous. So it's self-intelligent. So it can make decisions based on real-time information down at the shop floor level. It's passing information up to the ERP system or the MES system that can maybe affect how it's operating. But the, the control level uh, PLC is making those decisions in a, in a real-time way. If that makes sense. It does. Now, the, in the sense of uh, predictive maintenance versus predictive analytics, the holy grail, of course, is that you run that that um, uh, gate valve to the point of incipient failure, and then you replace it at one cycle before it's, it's predicted to fail Just at this time. point. Just in time, in a yeah. sense. Yeah, exactly. Is is that doable? Is that realistic? Can you really reduce uh, I mean, or lengthen maintenance schedules for for moving parts like this? I think so. I think manufacturers of different technologies need to identify the life of their products mm -hmm. accurately and then present it to different kinds of interfaces so that you can monitor that kind of operation and know exactly when you need to do your maintenance. And will, will factories be controlled by a single CPU? Will it be a single intelligence that runs everything? Or are we going to decentralize from the control and monitoring features uh, line by line or machine by machine? Everything's going to be decentralized because in the factory of the future, the complexity of the market is driving a lot of different things. Part types are changing rapidly. Um, part types are requiring complex processes, part types are multiple, part types are reconfigurable, and a lot of times customers want a part that they can um, customize and define by their individual preference. For one PLC to take care of all that is, is far too complex and it's not realistic. We need modules that can scale up and scale down in both capacity and functionality to, to meet that demand and for the factory to remain productive. 
Now, it's with all this information, all this useful information about, about performance on the shop floor, uh, by line, by machine, this information has tremendous value. And I can think even from uh, security aspects of it, industrial espionage aspects, is, is security an issue when you're aggregating, generating, aggregating so much information? It is, and that's one of the big kind of obstacles because the IT guys don't want to have their systems interfacing with the guys from the automation mm -hmm. systems. So there's been a big push to have interfaces that have inherent security. So OPC UA is an example that you can do machine to machine communication, you can do machine to cloud communication with that inherent security. So I think the IT world is becoming more and more comfortable with the idea of shop floor to top floor communication. And Ben, how far down the, uh, the supply chain and value chain does this level of high-end automation work? Because right, small and medium-sized businesses implement this, or do you have to be General Motors or, or Boeing to do this? I think the, the real push is for small to medium-sized enterprises to start introducing this technology. This can be seen as a competitive advantage and a, and a way to get into the market. Um, a lot of the big players aren't really going to necessarily introduce this kind of technology until it really suits them. They're already a market leader. So it's going to be the small to medium-sized companies that really make the push into this kind of technology. And then, um, as customers, as tier ones and tier twos to large OEMs at some point, will there be some pull for them to adopt these technologies just because their customer uses them? Perhaps. I think that it's going to be up to them to really put in that advantage. So manufacturers are going to start requiring that they have this kind of connectivity, that they have this kind of scalability in their equipment and it's going to be up to OEMs to really address that and provide that. Is there a threshold level of productivity or production beyond which you simply have to implement Industry 4.0 technologies? Is there some point at which you say we simply cannot refine our process anymore now we've got to make the leap? I think when, as we go from mass production to more of an agile system, it's, it's inevitable. If you're not really addressing these kind of technologies, then you're ultimately going to fail. How long do you feel before uh, this becomes uh, standard industry practice across all manufacturing? The projection is in the next 10 years, by 2025 or nine years, that we will have kind of the smart factory in play and in industry. The smart factory coming quickly, according to Ben Hope at Festo Canada.